GMGM, welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming. My name is Patrick Collins. Today we're going to be talking about how we go mainstream and the state of Web3 security. So we have a half hour. We have a lot of things to talk about. So we're going to go ahead and get started. This talk was partially inspired by a number of talks at the DeFi Security Summit that happened a couple of months ago. Uh, fantastic summit for anybody who wants to learn more about security, uh, Web3 security researchers, auditing, et cetera. So, for those of you who do not know, my name is Patrick Collins. I'm a smart contract developer, auditor, educator, security researcher, and just lover of all things Web3. Uh, you can see a couple of my socials here with QR codes. I am the co-founder of Cypher. We are a smart contract security research group. We do smart contract security reviews. Uh, we also run CodeHox, Solidit, and Web3 Education at Dev. Uh, and we make a lot of educational content. So you might have seen some of the videos we've made on Free Code Camp, uh, on my YouTube, on our YouTube. Uh, we love bringing up and putting Web3 into the hands of the masses and pushing the space to the next level by enabling developers to do more. And that's actually what brings us to this talk. How do we enable developers to do more? How do we bring Web3 to retail, to mainstream? Because it's not there right now. And a big reason that it's not there right now is because of what you're seeing on the screen right here. This is a graph from a group called Chainalysis. They do a lot of blockchain analysis, hence the name Chainalysis. And we see last year, 2022, there was $3.8 billion stolen out of the Web3 ecosystem with $3.1 billion coming directly from DeFi protocols. Pretty insane statistic. So the DeFi TVL today is around $40 billion. DeFi TVL hacked last year was $3.1 billion. The statistic there rounds out to around 7% of all DeFi TVL being hacked, stolen from, or removed in some capacity. 7%. And we're here saying, we have this better technology. Come to Web3. Come to smart contracts. We have these trust-minimized agreements. We have a more fair, more accountable financial ecosystem. But yet, 7%, whoosh, gone. And we want retail to adopt us. We want other people to use our services. That's kind of similar to us saying, hey, uh, welcome to DeFi. By the way, if you put your money here, there's a 1 in 20 chance that all of your money is gone next year. That's a pretty staggering statistic. And it's pretty unacceptable for the future of finance. So clearly, this is not sustainable if we want to see this Web3 thing that we're all working on go anywhere. So this needs to be addressed. Otherwise, what are we doing? No one's going to adopt this if this is the statistic. So in this talk, we're going to be talking a lot about how we got here how we can fix it moving forward. And like I was saying, a lot of this is inspired by a few different talks at, at uh, DSS. One of them was from uh, a guy named Peter. He runs this fantastic newsletter called Blockchain Threat Intelligence. It's a, it's a newsletter that keeps you up to date about different hacks in the industry, uh, which is incredibly essential for security researchers who want to stay up to date on the latest and greatest hacks. Uh, he made this fantastic top 10 risk profile of attacks that has happened for the first half of 2023. So this data is actually only accurate as of um, June. And since June, we've had at least another $500 million in hacks. So the, uh, this is around 500 million. Recently, we've had another additional 500 million. So we're already at around a billion dollars for this year, uh, which isn't a good look. So, uh, but in this talk, we are going to be going over some of these different attacks, these different threat models, uh, and basically how we solve them and what can we do. Uh, and it's really interesting if we look at top DeFi attack vectors, well, at least for the first half of 2023, and we can see that as of June, the number one attack, the number one, uh, the, the number one attack that had the most value stolen was a price oracle manipul or, excuse me, was price oracle manipulation attacks, which is very interesting, obviously, especially since we're at a, a Chainlink uh, uh, backed smart con, right, where we go, oh, price oracle manipulation, oh, just use Chainlink, you're good to go. It's still something that thwarts us today. Uh, for those of you here who are security researchers, you'll see like something like re-entrancy on here. So we're going to be going over kind of a lot of what, why this board is up here, what's going on, and how do we as a culture level up 
so this doesn't happen anymore. And we will get a little bit technical, hopefully not too technical, um, and you'll see when we get there. So yes, now we can ask, you know, what are we doing well? What are we doing poorly? What are these attacks? And then how do we prevent these attacks moving forward? Uh, or for me, this is a, a more broader question. For me, this question is actually, how do we reduce this number to go mainstream? Right? Because as we were saying before, if there's a 1 in 20 chance of you losing all your money, that is unacceptable. And all of you who are here right now are wasting your time, unless this number can be dropped. So, uh, but before actually we go into the bad stuff, let's start with some of the good stuff. So what's going well? What are we doing well in security? What are we doing well to actually push this space to, push this space to a more safe place? Well, in, in my view, we're actually uh, getting more pre-deploy security experts in this space. We've seen a huge, huge surge recently of independent smart contract security researchers jumping in, realizing A, there's an opportunity here, and B, that they can actually make a huge impact on what we're doing because of these numbers. We're seeing more education on Web3 security greatly improving. We're releasing content. We're seeing more people releasing content. We're seeing knowledge not be gated. We're seeing more people being able to jump in. And we're seeing a lot of tooling improve. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, a lot of these uh, more soon. And a big reason that a lot of this is enabled is because protocols are realizing they need to spend money on this stuff. Uh, given two options, either spend a million dollars on security or suffer a $100 million hack, the benefits are obvious, right? Uh, you're, you're talking about like a 99% uh, reduction in costs if you don't get hacked, which seems like, oh, okay, that, that sounds obvious. So we're seeing protocols take this more and more seriously. So but like I was saying, we're seeing more and more pre-deploy security experts. We're seeing uh, a lot of New faces and a lot of uh, old faces continue to grow, right? So Trail of Bits, Open Zeppelin, on Chain Security, Sigma Prime, a lot of these, uh, these security researchers, groups that have been around a long time, we're seeing them grow, we're seeing them do more, we're seeing new firms like ourselves, Cypherin, uh, new types of security groups coming out, or new types of security models like competitive audits, like Code Hawks. We're seeing the rise of solo auditors, and we're seeing a lot of these being fueled by a lot of these new initiatives that are coming through. Uh, we're seeing, like I said, we're seeing new types of security reviews going on, like the competitive audit. We're seeing things like Code Hawks, Code for Arena, Hats Finance. A lot of these uh, protocols are paving the way for security researchers to find a way in, make their first dollar, build that confidence, go forward, while also offering this phenomenal product to have many, many eyes looking at code bases. We're seeing education improving, like I was saying. We have protocols like Solidit, where some of the top, top smart contract auditors can read every day what are the latest hacks, what are the latest findings aggregated all in one place, so we have this continuous stream of knowledge for our security researchers. We have more YouTubes popping up. We have uh, newsletters on security. We're, get, we're just doing much, much, much better. Uh, Solidit is one in particular uh, that I want to call out because this is where a lot of modern day security researchers are, are living, right? They wake up, they say, okay, what are the newest findings? I'm going to learn those because I want to make sure that I'm up to date with the latest and greatest. Like I was saying, we're seeing more and more tooling, Foundry, Slither. I've got a video with a list of a ton of different types of tools. We're doing really good work here. So we're doing a lot of great stuff, and a lot of you might be thinking, okay, cool, but like, why are we hitting this, this $3 billion number in hacks? Why is that happening? So we can talk about what's not going so well. And so here are the four things that I think are not going so well and are definitely contributing to this 1.4, excuse me, this $3 billion number. Uh, the four things are centralized technology still plagues Web3. We have a lack of post-deployment practices. We are not following security best practices. And there's definitely a bit of a, a community versus security community disconnect. And I'll explain all that in just a second. So for this section, we are going to be going over some of these past exploits. Uh, and I want to stress that these, we should treat these as learning experiences. It's phenomenal that a lot of these protocols have written postmortems so that we can learn from what happened. Right? There's kind of this, this weird conflicting uh, opinions is the wrong word. There's this conflicting motives where a protocol who gets hacked, they often kind of want to hide. They don't want to tell anybody they got hacked. They want to keep it really secret. Oh, like we'll look bad if people know we got hacked. And it's fantastic when they come out with the postmortem. They keep that transparency. Uh, obviously, you know, most of the time we can see it on chain. But it's great when they do come out and they, they do say, hey, we got hacked, because that's going to help us as an industry 
grow and move better. So I want to stress that these we want to treat these as learning experiences, and we're not going to call anybody out. This is purely for educational purposes. The question is, how do we prevent these attacks from moving forward? So we're going to look at some attacks, some historical attacks, and say, okay, what could we have done better? What could we have an industry could have done better? So, uh, and like I said, so these are some of the, the top attacks. We're at a little over a billion dollars uh, in attacks, and we're actually going to start with um, uh, with Mixin Network, uh, the Mixin hack. Around a two hundred million dollar hack happened only a few weeks ago. So, for those of you who are new to the Web three industry, these type of attacks are unfortunately very common. Two hundred million dollar attack just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to oversimplify some of these. Some of these are, are very complicated attacks, and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, but one of the big things for this attack that uh, caused a lot of issues here was the fact that there's, uh, they were using a lot of centralized tech. right? So in their uh, announcement, they announced that, hey, there was this uh, cloud service provider that they were using that got compromised and $200 million out the door. Um, if a centralized cloud service can get hacked and you lose $200 million, there's, a, there's an issue with centrality. Okay, using a centralized service, we have all these better tools, we have this decentralized nature, and yet we're using a lot of uh, you know, Web2 centralized tooling and getting hacked. So unfortunately, this is actually all too common for a lot of centralized tooling happening. We've seen uh, time and time again where like a multi-sig of a two or three multi-sig where the, the two keys in this two or three multi-sig are actually the same person, uh, they get hacked. This is an issue that we see a lot. Or, yeah, uh, so uh, another example of this actually was one of the more recent poly network hacks. They had a three of four multi-sig. Three keys were the same, were on the same machine. That machine got hacked. All the money got stolen, right? So the answer here is we really want to be focusing on doing exactly what we want to be doing. We want to be pushing the decentralized space, right? We're using this better technology. Let's use it to its fullest. So keep the centralized tech for Web2. We need to be, as a community, holding ourselves accountable, saying, OK, we need to be moving away from a lot of these centralized, um, uh, centralized technologies. Next, what's not going well? Uh, a lack of post-deployment practices. And if you were at the Hacker House yesterday, I talked at length uh, about this. Uh, here's a photo. Again, this is from Peter's talk uh, at the DeFi Security Summit, where we see compromise, detection, and triage of some of the uh, largest hacks from this year. Right. So thanks again to, to Peter for this graphic. So uh, multi-chain, bonked out, urine. Um, I always pronounce it wrong. Boiler? Euler? Um, they had a hack. Uh, they had a large hack happen. There was around uh, nine minutes until the hack was noticed and alerted, and around two hours until something was, was done about it, basically. Uh, multi-chain, uh, an hour went by before something happened, and around five hours till something, you know, it was triaged. Um, this is showing kind of where we are uh, as a space, uh, immaturity-wise, for actually detecting some of these attacks beforehand and doing something, right? If we can detect one of these attacks beforehand, we can do something before a lot of the damage is done, or when the damage is done, we can immediately jump in and start remediating. Every single second after an attack happens is a second that the attacker has to get away and leave without a trace, right? And it's something that we're not doing very well um, following up with, right? So a lot of these protocols, they want to move quickly. They're, they're making a lot of deployments. They're making a lot of upgrades. Sometimes these upgrades introduce security vulnerabilities, and we need to be able to react very quickly, and we are not reacting very quickly right now. So we have a lot of focus, especially like in education and training, on how to build amazing protocols, how to, how to use amazing tools, how to, how to defend against attacks. But what we aren't really doing right now is, OK, when an attack does happen, what's the procedure? How many developers here? Actually, let's see, raise a hand. How many, how many developers are here? Raise a hand. We develop, oh, lovely. OK, great. I should ask that at the beginning. Um, how many of you developers that raise your hand, which uh, was the majority of the group, have practiced getting in a war room scenario? Exactly, right? Three or four people out of maybe, maybe 100, 150 hands went up actually have practiced getting a war room scenario. Right? That's kind of showing right here the level of maturity that we're at. If, you, if when one of these bombs drops, one of these hacks happen, and you haven't practiced, you're going to be sitting there going, oh, shit, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? 
And that's the difference between catching the bad guys, remo uh, returning some of the funds, and not. Uh, so we, luckily though, we, we've been doing really well with uh, protocols coming up like Immunify, Hats Finance, that have a lot of these bug bounty programs, but we're not pushing a lot of these bug bounty programs enough, right? We have this, these, these systems where they say, hey, if there is a hack, come, uh, tell us about it, and we'll pay you out, right? Making sure the incentives are correct here. Uh, we, we might not be doing as good of a job. So, and, and just making sure that this is a, a standard practice to say, okay, cool, you've deployed, let's get you a bug bounty so that you can prevent some of these attacks. Okay, what else? Uh, not following security best practices. This is uh, definitely oversimplifying this issue, but it's, it's something, uh, it's an issue nonetheless. Uh, and we can start by looking again at some of the, uh, these different type of attack vectors. Um, excuse me, and uh, we're going to be talking about a, a few of them in particular. We'll start with uh, price oracle manipulation, because this one is still playing against to today, but it's actually not as easy to fix as we might think it would be. So we, we have a couple examples that happened recently. We had Bonk Dow, 120 million, 100 Finance for 4.7 million, um, and at the end of the day, these are uh, you can kind of oversimplify them to basically. Somebody was able to use some type of math, some type of flash loan oftentimes, to manipulate the price of something to something else. So Sam Zizi Sun kind of humorously sums one up saying, oh, yeah, a extremely sophisticated attacker uh, said, okay, by the way, one ALBT equals five million Matic now, and the protocol goes, okay, word, sounds good. Um, oftentimes, flash loans are, are done to use these, and a lot of times we think, okay, the easy solution, obviously, just use a decentralized oracle. That can't be bribed. Don't use an exchange as an oracle. But a lot of times protocols uh, don't have these as options, right? They, some questions will come up like, hey, well, what if uh, I want the price of a token that has low liquidity? What if my token isn't supported on a chain link price feed? Uh, what do I do then? And that's when they start trying to you know, use exchanges as an oracle, use uh, some type of uh, liquidity pool as an oracle. And that where it can get, that's where it can get much, much more difficult. Uh, because maybe you have a, a token where the liquidity is, you know, a, there's maybe a, a million dollars total in, in money that can be manipulated. The real price of that can be manipulated easily. And you're, technically that's not a price oracle manipulation, that's like an actual price oracle manipulation. So a lot of the times we think this can be, this is actually a really easy problem to solve. Sometimes it's actually a lot harder than we think it is. So there's, there's a lot of nuance that goes into this, but there are, at least at the high level, often times where there is a simple answer. It's like, hey, you know, use a decentralized oracle that can't be bribed. Don't use an exchange as an oracle. Um, and it's, it's only in some of these, these more weird use cases where the liquidity is weird or, or you have a token that's not supported where uh, the, the real answer to this is, is much, much more difficult. Uh, so reentrancy, this is, thankfully, we are getting much better at reentrancy. So on that top 10 list, it was actually nine or 10. Um, this is one of the oldest hacks in the book. So the famous DAO hack was a reentrancy attack. And you'll even hear people say it, the classic reentrancy attack. So we've known about this attack since 2016, right? So it's nine years, or wait, no, four plus three, seven years, excuse me. So we've known about this attack for a long time, and we're still getting hit by it today. And there's a lot of best practices that uh, a lot of developers follow uh, to prevent this that are, 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 are very basic to what we should be doing, but a lot of developers still don't know about these security practices. So who here is familiar with the terminology CEI? Raise your hand if you're familiar with CEI. Okay, great, perfect example here, right? So uh, we had a raise of hand, most people here are developers, almost nobody raised their hand and knew what CEI is, right? So CEI, some of the security researchers um, drill. You'll hear them always talk about this, you'll hear the people comment this, it stands for checks, effects, interactions, and it's a, it's a basic security best practice for uh, not getting hit by reentrancy attacks. And if all of your functions follow this pattern, you actually won't get attacked. But uh, one of the trickier things about reentrancy is, is we have seen a couple new flavors. Um, you might have heard about read-only reentrancies. Uh, so we are seeing attackers get more clever with classic attacks. So, but again, uh, to me, this kind of falls back on the hey, like what are we doing with our best um, security practices? There's some things that we all need to be following. We need to be following CEI, and this goes all the way back to um, to education and getting the word out we need to do a much better job of making sure that you know, the next time 
I'm in a room in SmartCon and I say, hey, you know, what developer knows what CEI is, we see all the hands go up, right? So that's not even a question of, of what this thing is and even the lowest level, excuse me, even the most, um, the, the most junior of security researchers can be like, oh, you gotta follow CEI. So we, we, we as a culture need to be leveling up our security uh, culture for a lot of these best practices. So we've seen attacks where um, uh, a protocol will make some change to their protocol, not get it reviewed, and deploy. And that's something that we can't be doing, right? If, if you're going to be changing immutable code, it needs to be peer reviewed. You need to go undergo a security review, often known as an audit. Uh, and this is something, again, it just it needs to be common. Uh, it needs to be commonplace for us as a community to say this is the new security norm. These need to be followed. And then finally, uh, my final piece here, where I think uh, we're we're not doing such a great job, is actually community and security disconnect. And this is, I think, one of the hardest problems to solve. And I don't have the answers to this yet. An audit or security review. You'll hear me refer to it as a security review. Oftentimes, they're called audits. It does not mean that a protocol is safe for users. And a lot of protocols and a lot of users will say, was such and such audited? As if it's this binary flag where if yes, it's audited, yes, it's safe, no, it's audited, no, it's not safe. That's actually not the case at all. Uh, and one of the big reasons why it's not the case is because oftentimes in these audit reports, they will call out the exact vulnerability um, that ends up getting exploited. It's just that the community said, oh, they were audited by so-and-so, that must mean they're safe. So this is an excerpt from, uh, I, I'm gonna pronounce that wrong, so I'm not even gonna bother, from a protocol that lost $2.1 million only a couple of months ago. In the audit, it literally called out, hey, by the way, it looks like this protocol, the owners can rug pull you, um, the protocol told us specifically not to audit the rug pull uh, contract, um, so we're not going to make any claim about uh, how unrug pullable this is, right? And so a lot of people jumped in this protocol and ended up rug pulling for $2.1 million. And this is again where people were like, oh, but it was audited. But they called out right in the audit, like, hey, the scope of this was borderline malicious. So whenever protocols go for audits, they go for security reviews, they get to define what's called the scope or what contracts uh, they're going to pay you for, right? So an auditor, a security researcher firm, they're going to get paid for whatever the, the protocol wants to review. So it's really security reviews or audits are for the protocol, they're not for the community. Because again, the, the protocol can say, hey, don't audit our rug pull contract. I don't want that going in the report. You know, luckily, this was a report where they said, hey, we noticed that this is rug pullable. Um, they told us not to do it, but, and they, they uh, fantastically did include it in the report. Right? So we got lucky there. Oftentimes, we won't. But we got unlucky that they put this in the report, and people still aped in. Right? So there's this huge, huge disconnect right now. And to be honest, I'm not sure what the answer is, because we, we haven't been doing a good job saying, an audit is not a guarantee a code base is safe. Uh, so where can we improve? Where can we improve on a lot of these issues? So uh, there's a couple places that we can just, just start just to make this a lot better. And there's a number of things that we can uh, kind of refactor as a community to make a lot, uh, a lot of these a lot better. Uh, one thing that we can do to improve a lot of this is to have multiple rounds of security reviews. Uh, oftentimes, getting a single review from a single person is great, um, but it's not going to be enough. You're, you're going to miss stuff. You're not going to catch something. Um, but you should at least do one, if not for the community, for you as a protocol, right? Because we just saw audits are not for the community, they're for the protocol. But if you don't get one, uh, you're going to miss really easy stuff. Number two, security is an ongoing process and not a one-time fix. And to me, this is, uh, again, a lot of these are kind of cultural tweaks, but I think it's these cultural tweaks that are going to uh, make a huge, huge uh, impact on what we're doing. We're seeing, like I was saying, a lot of these protocols go, hey, I want to get that checkbox. I want to have, have it done. But we just saw, hey, sometimes there will be hacks. And if you don't think of security as an ongoing process, you're going to get hacked. And it's going to be six hours till you do something about that hack. That's way too long. You should be 
uh, monitoring, you should be checking to see, hey, am I about to get hacked? What's going on on chain? Uh, security is a, an ongoing process, right? You want to be constantly working with security researchers, constantly working with, with groups that can keep your security at a high level, as opposed to going, okay, I need to check this box off uh, to move on. Because everything we're talking about here, everything, I want to say 95% of security researchers and security firms are very well versed in. So making sure we're, you're having, as protocols, we're having connections with these security experts um, is, is crucial, right? And it, and it even goes back to what we were showing before. I said, hey, who knows what CEI is? This very simple design pattern to uh, prevent reentrances. Three people raised their hands out of a group of 150 people who said they were developers, right? So just saying, hey, security researchers, how can we stay safe? Keep advising me, keep giving me information on how to make my protocol better. That needs to be the norm. It's a journey. It's not a one-time thing. Keep that conversation going. Uh, follow a lot of these modern best practices, a lot of them we talked about here. Um, there's a ton of phenomenal resources to learn best practices. Uh, SecureContracts.com by Trillibits is fantastic. Uh, Web3Education.dev. Uh, we're coming out with uh, a lot of security curriculum soon. Uh, we have a lot of uh, blogs and videos on the topics already. Uh, there's uh, damn, do, uh, damn Vulnerable DeFi, uh, Ethernaut, there's a ton of phenomenal places where you can learn about security and you can learn these modern best practices. And then finally, this is specifically for the community part. While we fix things, which sounds very blanket, but I, I mean it as such, while we fix this culture that we're not doing so hot of a job with right now, invest at your own risk because I'm going to go way back. Uh, how quickly can I hit this button? Uh, let me get a quick uh, tour of the, uh, of the talk again. Because while we fix this thing, all of these security pieces, this is the current world we live in. And this is unacceptable. So we're going to do our best to fix this and hopefully make DeFi and Web3 a much safer better place and actually deliver on the promise that we've promised to everybody of a more fair, more accountable financial system. So thank you all for coming.